how would you describe you know, what we've seen in the markets over the few last few weeks? It's been quite remarkable. Uh, and really what we've seen is one of the most rapid breakdowns in global economics and market functioning that, um, that I've witnessed and I think anyone has witnessed in their careers. In terms of sort of looking at this sort of from a strategist perspective, what do you think people should be looking out for in the sort of medium and longer term? Yeah, I think that's really important. It does feel a little bit like, particularly yesterday and perhaps throughout this week, we're getting past what I call peak panic, um, where all of these events just cascaded on top of each other to literally break markets. Liquidity was just absent and there were liquidations where all assets went down. The only thing that went up was the US dollar. We think we're getting past peak panic because we've got all of this stimulus that market functioning might return. And as a result, I think what um, we're going to be able to do a bit more clearly is focus on the health ramifications and whether the measures are um, effective and whether there are any medical interventions that can help and also get more back to the economic consequences because you know our portfolios really have shifted quite dramatically most investors have needed to cash up for margin calls um, uh, or simply to de-risk portfolios into these events and there will be much more opportunity to look for selective new investments. Um, some long, some short. I work in absolute return funds. Uh, but hopefully we're past peak panic. I just am not sure we're past peak pessimism. Mm. And in terms of the looking at the markets from a sort of an asset allocation perspective, um, if there is now some cash on the sidelines, you know, how do you expect that to, to start to be distributed? Yeah. So what's interesting is that we've just probably, we are currently exiting you know, a liquidity crisis, but we're staring down the barrel of something that's going to look like a very deep recession or potentially almost depression-like. Uh, lots of stimulus to try and offset that. Um, but that means we might just be entering a solvency crisis. And so this is a very different environment where looking at traditional valuation metrics on earnings are irrelevant. Um, we really are looking at um, we need to ascertain what the permanent value destruction is going to be and where it is. So we're starting to talk about capital structure. You know, if you're an equity investor, you're at the end of the capital structure. So if you're in equities, you really want to make sure you're in an equity that is viable, um, not just in the short term from a liquidity perspective, but from the medium term from a solvency perspective and from the long term from a profits perspective. Uh, and at the moment, we're not really too interested in adding new equity exposures, except very, very selectively. But within credit, uh, you know, bonds are higher up the capital structure for a start. And particularly when you go beyond high yield bonds into investment grade bonds, for example, you're now getting relatively explicit guarantees or support from central banks. Um, the Fed are now purchasing investment grade, uh, investment grade corporate bonds in the US. So where we're putting money to work um, imminently is really into those sorts of assets, high quality assets that have derated to recessionary level prices, where we feel like there's a reasonable asymmetry and reasonable protection, and particularly it's where policy support is targeted. And do you think there's any risk that the very large scale government bond uh, programs, is there um, the possibility that with the kind of supply shock that we've seen, if demand is sort of re-stimulated, that actually we may end up with some inflation? Uh, I think inflation would be a wonderful problem to have. Uh, <laughs> for, the, for the moment, um, it's probably too early to tell because clearly what we're experiencing, much like the crisis, is an enormous deflationary shock. Mm. Um, the policy support is designed to offset that. Uh, certainly monetary support is doing its best to plug the hole. Fiscal support um, in conjunction with monetary support will hopefully pay off some of those problems, but we're still going to have big output gaps everywhere. So it's not obvious that you necessarily get inflation in the typical sense, wage inflation, much like we haven't seen for the last decade. But one of the issues with this particular um, scenario where you've got a deflationary shock with enormous amounts of money printing to try and offset it is that liquidity doesn't get spread evenly. You know, to some extent, there is plenty of liquidity out there. There's plenty of money in the world. It's just that it is almost free to the people who don't need it. And it is almost unavailable at any price to those that do. So it's still a world of bifurcation. And um, to understand whether this is going to be inflationary probably matters what type of inflation you're talking about. I don't think for most people in the near future, it implies they're going to get wage increases. 
but it might well imply that certain assets where um, you know you have a, a real and tangible ownership uh, and an income stream on that, so land, for example, may well be a beneficiary once again, as it was during the crisis. So perhaps more asset inflation than um, than anything else for the moment. Yeah. Tony, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Is there anything sort of very obvious that sort of that we haven't discussed that's on your mind? Yeah, I think it's important as we talk about whether, you know, I, I talk about going past peak panic towards peak pessimism. The important thing about understanding peak pessimism is that I think the market still underestimates the, um, maybe not the depth of the problems we're facing in the next couple of months, but very likely the duration. I still sense that citizens, uh, first of all, and also investors believe this to be a few month problem, and then we almost snap back to normal life. And I think it's important people read some of the scientific research like the Imperial study that really does suggest that it's unlikely that that occurs. That would be our best case scenario under these circumstances. And actually what's much more likely is we're living with this um, for the next year. There's a very good article called The Hammer and the Dance that's worth reading as well. Uh, and so the consequences really need to be assessed over a longer time frame than just the next few months. And as the market starts to catch up with that, we might start getting deeper level recessionary pricing, more opportunities, but equally more clarity about what the future looks like, uh, both as citizens and investors. There's actually one more thing I think uh, probably worth focusing on too, is that as much as uh, we might need to um, use mitigation or suppression measures for a long time to get through this crisis from a health perspective, uh, a lot of the analysis is based on um, numbers without hope. Uh, and probably never before have we had the capacity and the global coordination to really target just a singular outcome. And that is uh, medicines that will get people out of ICUs faster or preferably a cure or vaccine. So it's very important as investors in terms of understanding how long we are going to be dealing with these consequences to keep a very close eye on the medical side of things as well, because that's really going to be critical for um, how much capital is destroyed in this particular recession.